This weekend, F1 is at the newly altered Marina Bay Street Circuit in Singapore that now stretches for 4.94 kilometers with 19 corners rather than 23. And today, we're going to talk more generally about the technical patterns we see across street tracks and their growing role in the Formula One calendar. Okay, last week I made a graph to compare drivers to their teammates throughout the years, and surprise, surprise, I've made one again for this video. And although this one is a little bit more simple, I think it's a good illustration of both the overall F1 calendar growth, and at this bottom section, you can see the growing proportion of street races within that calendar. Just for consistency's sake, and because it helped with my argument, I've counted the edge cases here, like Sochi, Jeddah, and Canada. So it's pretty obvious to see where these trend lines are pointing, but why? Well, economically speaking, for investors and promoters, street racing is attractive for a few reasons. If you're already a major world city, you'll likely have an airport or two, a massive hotel capacity, and a whole flock of restaurants, landmarks, and businesses ready to serve and sell to the tourists who may come to watch the Grand Prix. These are going to be tried and tested urban environments that have had the chance to develop and grow naturally. Now, that's much better in some senses than building a whole new facility from scratch. Now, this attractiveness to investors, marketers and photographers, and ticket promoters is juxtaposed with the logistical challenges that race teams and circuit organisers face. They've got to get the barriers up, get the safety facilities and hospitality in place, ready for the Grand Prix. So let's think about Monaco, a country of just 38,000 plays host along with Nice in the south of France to over 200,000 fans throughout the weekend they host their Grand Prix. 21 kilometers of metal barriers, 670 marshals, a whole independent crew of fire marshals means that around 3,000 people in total come together to make F1's crown jewel race happen. And because we're in Monaco, we'll talk money because annually it's estimated that over 100 million euros are generated for the Monaco economy by the Grand Prix. Now, it should be mentioned, of course, that Monaco is a very, very special example of wealth flaunting super yachts and shady tax regulations. But the wider point about F1 Grand Prix bringing huge guaranteed economic value to cities that host street races stands across the calendar. Street tracks are almost like a safe bet for organisers. Ironic, I suppose, given F1's return to Vegas later this year. But having all that mass population infrastructure in place means that with proper management, you can create an awesome atmosphere where F1 just takes over the city for the weekend and shares its action at city centres throughout the world. All right, let's move on from economics and talk tech because the combined factors in Singapore of the twisty track design and the hot climate place an enormous strain on the braking systems of the Formula One cars. On average at street tracks, the corner radii are tighter, and this is largely due to the puzzle solving involved in their design process. With the new track, it's like having a blank canvas, but when you're forced to use normal junctions and pure creativity to make overtaking zones, the frequent and abrupt changes in speed required put heavy stress on the brakes. Then you combine this overheating with the effect on the engines and the drivers. It means it's going to be a really, really hot one in Singapore, and the cooling is going to be critical to maintaining reliability throughout the race. And navigating the bumps, undulations and tight corners of street tracks also means that the suspension setup of Formula One cars becomes increasingly crucial here, both in tailoring each setting on the car to its maximally efficient value, but also in creating a feel for the drivers that gives them enough confidence to push right up close to the walls. There's also a bit of a perspective trick at play here, because the closer you are up to that wall means that on the onboard camera, flying past the barriers and the adverts that populate the wall is going to illustrate that sense of speed because you're so much closer to them. If you compare that then to a really wide track where the barriers are all the way on the edge and much further away, it looks as though they're moving more slowly because of that changed distance. Now you might think intuitively that on a street track, track limits would be less of an issue, but actually all it does is change the risk reward maps. Instead of a white line, it's a barrier, but the track inside of that white line, the track inside of that barrier is exactly the same and you should be able to push up to it like a white line to extract the lap time. But as I said, the maths are weighted up differently. The risk of going over it is so much higher, which again is going to test the drivers to see who really has that feel, that connection with the car to nail the lap. That confidence is really what's going to deliver that final lap time. Just like Lewis did in 2018 in Singapore, you're seeing that maximized to its ultimate limit. Now the camber of corners also comes into play as a factor here. On traditional circuits, we talk about a corner being off or on camber, depending on whether the apex is lowered or elevated relative to the outside of the track. But normal roads are cambered on both sides, sloping downwards on the outside for drainage. And if the designer creates an overtaking zone or a junction in an unorthodox way, we're gonna see that camber come into play and throw the cars up in the air. So you can expect to see a lot of drivers complaining about bouncing, a little bit like we're going back to the start of last year because those problems are going to be unavoidable with these ground effect cars because they run so low to the ground. 
And it's not really accurate to say that tyre management and strategy matter to a larger extent on street tracks, as they are of course hugely important determining factors no matter the race. The street circuits typically exhibit a larger likelihood of safety car deployments due to the narrow confines and the proximity of the barriers. This then significantly impacts race strategy calls, and like we've watched Ferrari and some other teams, but mostly Ferrari, struggle with throughout the years, that decision of whether you come in, whether you think it's a VSC, a full safety car, and being able to play that to your best advantage is really, really going to change the race for your team and drivers. And additionally, since you're on a street track that is, again, harder to overtake at and therefore favours track position over maximum theoretical lap time, taking these opportunities can be extra valuable. If you jump someone in the running order, you can do your best Fernando Monaco 2021 impression and keep half the grid stuck behind your rear bumper. Qualifying well on Saturday is a key foundational step in locking in a good result on Sunday. Alright then, we've got plenty to watch for this weekend and throughout the future of F1, the street tracks gain importance on the calendar. They really showcase the most dramatic aspects of the cars, are attractive investments and often cause chaos on the calendar. Maybe we'll get some chaos this weekend, but maybe it'll be another win for Max. Either way, thank you very much for watching and make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out our website, Crash.net, for motorsport coverage from all of our team around the racing world.